Having heard of several nuggets, some of them of considerable size, that have lately been found in the Whipstick, a distance of about 15 miles from Bendigo, as correspondent for the Melbourne Argus, I determined to observe from personal observation what was going on in this gold digging land of mystery. We descended the hill and plunged into the bush. Here onward we went over a flat and upper range, down into the valley below and up the opposite range, and so on mile after mile. Everywhere was quartz, quartz in the ranges making them snow white and constantly cropping out in large masses. Look which way you like, tread which way you please, everywhere you encountered quartz. In the present unsettled state of the diggings, it is the utmost importance that proper information should be given to the public respecting the diggings, more especially new rushes. And having come here with a mob of 14 and sunk holes in every part and rambled for miles through the scrub, I have no hesitation in saying that is a complete shicer. As to the wand of water so much talked about, I cannot see it, for there are no piles of washed dirt stacked as I expected to see. In fact, there is none worth stacking. And it is a crying shame for interested parties to spread reports to delay the hard-working digger to leave where he can probably make tucker. When Victoria was pronounced a colony in 1850, Bendigo was still a sheep run, with just a couple of shepherd's huts along the creek down in the valley. Now despite shepherds and various visitors from nearby homesteads making use of that creek for around 10 years, it wasn't until spring 1851 that gold was officially discovered. By the end of that year there were around 700 diggers working the creek, and 1852 brought around 15,000 diggers and their families to find their fortune on Bendigo and nearby Eagle Hawk. It was pretty well all alluvial or shallow gold they were seeking, and the diggers needed plenty of water for their pans and cradles, and of course to quench their thirst. In 1852, Victoria was in droughts and nobody was too keen to venture far from the creeks. This kept the diggers out of the whipstick. With no sign of water, of course no guarantees of finding gold, it was safer to stick to the gullies of Bendigo and Eagle Hawk for now. It didn't stop a few more adventurous types though trying their luck on the periphery of the whipstick, including here on Whitehorse Gully, the site of some pretty impressive finds in 1852. There were some large nuggets found here, including one they called the Dascom, a whopping chunk of gold weighing 10 kilo. Another nugget called the Victorian was found by a young bloke from Kilmore who apparently fainted at the sight of it. The story goes he was taken to the Gold Commissioner's tent to recover and on returning to his hole the next day found it cleaned out by a candle fossicker, one of those unscrupulous buggers who clean out other people's mine shafts while they sleep. Apparently he lost his marbles a second time and spent the rest of his days riding around on a horse telling anyone who would listen, I'm the bloody wretch who found the nugget. I jumped ship I've hauled the town Cause it was not sailing this way To fields of gold Where dreams come true Nothing would get Here on Lightning Hill, way. just above Whitehorse Gully, diggers must have looked out over the whipstick and wondered if hidden beneath its dense scrub and iron bark forest there wasn't another rich gold field like Bendigo or Eagle Hawk. So buy me a drink, boys And I'll tell you my tale Of iron bark and blind and white quartz Out in the whipstick The rushes of the whipstick didn't really begin until after 1855, even though around Bendigo and Eagle Hawk, most of the gullies had been well and truly worked out when it came to surface gold by early 1853. More and more diggers were leaving, 
And for the ones that stayed, most were lucky to make tucker. That is, find enough food to feed themselves. As for out here in the whipstick, most of it looked the same. A man could easily get lost out here. Whipstick was actually named because the locals believed that the only thing that these Mallee eucalypts were good for was making whips. Another deterrent was the absence of any natural water sources out here. It's not hard to imagine how easily an ill-prepared digger could have perished as he floundered around searching for gold. In fact, of the early diggers venturing out into the whipstick, nobody can be sure how many were destined never to return. Now Sydney flat on the western edge of the whipstick had actually been worked also since 1852. It was only a couple of miles from the Eagle Hawk diggings. A little village had started to spring up along the track winding through Sydney flat with more permanent structures like miners huts and cottages, stores and of course pubs like the Thistle Hotel. The Thistle Hotel, situated on Sydney flat, fronts the main road to the whipstick diggings and has an undeniable position for a good business. The hotel is built of weatherboards with zinc roof and handsome veranda. French doors and windows give the house a light and elegant appearance. The hotel contains a capacious bar assembly, dining and bagatelle rooms and numerous bedrooms. Now there's a couple of stories about how Sydney Flat was named. One of the stories was there was a Dr. Sydney, and he was apparently one of the first to move to the area, no doubt trading his scalpel for a pick. There's another story that a group of sailors had moved down from Sydney and they were the first to mine the area, probably jumping ship before they left. Now there was a second rush underway here at the bottom end of Sydney Flat in 1856, with about 2,000 diggers living and working here. That included a large group of German miners who were apparently getting around 12 ounces of gold to the dray load of wash dirt. That's about 12 ounces of gold per tonne of dirt. Now water was always a problem. Of course you needed it to wash the dirt and clay away, but with no natural waterways, diggers often had to pile their wash dirt up next to their claim and wait for rain to come so that they could wash it. Now this meant that the chances of other diggers stealing a bit of your gold was a little bit higher. There are actually stories of diggers fosking through their own dirt, looking for bits of gold so that they could pay for tucker and a drink while they waited for the rains to come. The other option for getting your stuff washed was moving it by dray or wheelbarrow to a dam that was hopefully not too many miles away. Now you would be charged for the use of this water and the use of the puddling machine like this one that was once run by a bloke called Quinn on Sydney Flat. Puddling machines need a lot of water and Quinn would have carved out the large dam above the puddler to make sure he had plenty in storage. The puddler was lined with timber and the wash dirt containing the gold was loaded into the puddler along with plenty of water. A horse pulled a kind of rake around and tried to break up the clay and dirt allowing the gold to drop to the bottom. The worthless dirt and clay will have mixed with the water and be drained out leaving the gold rich gravel at the bottom of the puddler. This was then panned or cradled to get rid of the remaining rubbish, leaving just the shiny stuff. Sydney Flat meets Beezlebub Gully. There was actually a Chinese camp in the 1860s that existed for quite a while. 
I spent a lot of time rewashing piles of dirt left behind by impatient diggers who'd already left for what they hoped were richer pastures. Some of the Chinese had puddling machines and they removed large amounts of surface dirt for treatment. Their income would have been pretty small and life very rough for these Chinese diggers. One young fella, Sua Kung, he rigged up a crude gallow over a shallow 10 foot hole and he hung himself. It's sad to think that things got so bad out here that he ended his life so far away from his family. Driven by the growing stories of gold being found further out in the whipstick, more and more diggers driven by a dream of riches and a more immediate need to eat started to forge their way further out into the ironbark forests, looking for good spots to try their luck. Now I'm in a little village called the Whipstick Village, which was the site of one of the first gold rushes into the interior of the Whipstick, on nearby Scotchman's Gully. Now of course there were no roads, just a couple of tracks, one from Sydney Flat and the other direct from Bendigo from a spot called Ironstone Hill. Although we know that small parties of diggers were sinking holes in the area as early as 1855, it wasn't until early 1857 that a population here reached around 1200. The gold was patchy, like everywhere else on the whipstick. And although some of the diggers did alright, most of them struggled to make tucker. Now the miners lived in tents along about one kilometre of this gully, among the temporary shops and beer tents that would spring up wherever there were diggers. There were butchers, bakers, bush stores, blacksmiths. Some of these store owners must have thought they were going to be here for a while because they built large stores out of slab timber. Some of the more kindly store owners even extended credit to the diggers, tidying them over till they struck gold. One of the store owners, a Mr Fletcher, agreed to team up with one of the diggers and grub him, that is, supply him with food, until they struck gold. They worked together for two months and found very little until the day, Eureka, they struck a seven ounce nugget. The digger shot through to Bendigo, went on a bender lasting a few days. Mr Fletcher tried to get the law onto his side, but lucked out as the local court, most likely an Eagle Hawk, considered it to be a disputed case of mining partnership. Of course, lack of permanent water was a problem here just like it was everywhere else in the whipstick. And in the summer months when it was hot and dry, some diggers tended to leave. But diggers were always coming and going in these years, many ending up very disappointed with a little return for their hard work. Sir, we must beg of you to contradict your statement that there is plenty of water on the place. It is a most villainous statement, and myself and 50 brother diggers not that one could not do it. Intend given your reporter, if we can get hold of him and bring it home to him, as sound a drubbing as his villainous lie deserves. These false statements cause men to leave comfortable home, to face and contend with disappointments and perhaps misery. There is no water here not even to wash a shirt with. Now it's ironic that in the same edition of the Bendigo Advertiser, where the letter from the disgruntled digger appeared in, there was another story about a nugget weighing 370 ounces that was found on Scutchman's Gully was also included. Now that nugget was later offered as the main prize in a raffle, believe it or not. Now the original camp hotel was built in 1857 of wooden slabs for a Mary Deeming, who many knew as the Queen of the Whipstick. Now Mary was a very smart lady, and not only did she do very well out of the original hotel, she also had a dam built at the head of Scotchman's Gully, where she installed a puddling machine, which was also a very tidy sideline. All was well until the summer of 1861, when Mary, answering a knock on the door around nine o'clock one night, was confronted by four armed bandits. They knocked her to the ground with a butt of a pistol, dragged her inside and tied her up. Now the bandits had control of the hotel for several hours, including tying and beating up another five diggers who'd called in for a drink. 
they got away with several ounces of gold, grog and groceries, and they were never heard of again, never caught. Now Mary, understandably, was pretty shaken up, and the following year she sold the hotel to a John Dolman, and Mary moved away from the whipstick. It was John Dolman who replaced the original hotel with the one you see today in the mid-1860s. By the end of 1857, Scotsman's Gully was petering out and diggers were looking north for the next big rush. Here around what is now known as Neilborough, gold was discovered at the end of 1857 and by the end of that year there were around 1,500 diggers living and working here. They named it Elysian Flat and that may conjure up peaceful scenes of tranquility and brotherly love, but the reality was anything but. Elysian Flat was to become the wild west of the Whipstick Goldfields, where anarchy reigned supreme. The few water holes that were around Elysian Flat were soon exhausted as more and more miners started sinking holes. Again, unless the diggers were willing to wait for rain, they needed to arrange to have their wash dirt carted about three and a half miles to be treated, and that cost them 15 shillings a load. Of course, water was only a problem for those diggers who were actually working their claim. Elysian Flat had its fair share of shepherds, that is, diggers who would stake out a claim, but would then sit around and wait to see what the blokes in the neighbouring claim, whether they did any good. If the neighbours did well, the shepherds got stuck into their claim. If the neighbours did poorly, the shepherds would move on looking for other spots in the diggings where those at work were doing all right. Now, it was hard going for diggers sinking holes out in the whipstick. There was little in the way of nuggets lying around on the surface. At Elysian Flat, at the shallow end of the lead, there were sinking holes around 20 to 40 feet deep, or 6 to 12 metres. At the deep end of the lead, they were sinking shafts as deep as 120 feet, which is nearly 40 metres deep. That's a lot of digging. Now, the summer of 1857 and 1858 was hot and dry with bushfires, no rain, and the cost of water an exorbitant eight shillings for around 30 or 40 gallons. Now the water was full of nasty bacteria and was causing dysentery and even scurvy. Yet the diggers kept coming, often traveling by night to escape the heat. And by March 1858, the population of Elysian Flat was around 3,000. What kept them coming was a steady occurrence of nuggets being found ranging between around 24 to 75 ounces, with many more smaller ones. And when the rains did come, the wash dirt also paid well. But they wanted rain, not a storm. On the 29th of April, the skies opened up and rain came in torrents flooding the mines and tent city that had sprung up. Dams that had been built in readiness for some rain overflowed and valuable heaps of wash dirt was washed away along with cradles and tubs and anything else that was not nailed down. The diggers in the township recovered quickly though and it soon returned to business as usual. Now, even though there were several thousand diggers and their families living and working on Elysian Flat, there were no permanent policemen stationed here, which of course made it a dangerous place to be. Two or three times a week, perhaps a couple of troopers would ride over from Myers Flat, have a little bit of a look around, but that was about it. Now, the law-abiding citizens of Elysian Flat appealed for better police protection, but to no avail. And Sunday, now Sunday was a day for recreation in Elysian Flat. And when I say recreation, I mean bare knuckle fist fights in the streets and the hotels. One Sunday, a man was killed in one of those fist fights. The following Sunday, another poor fellow named Blake had his head caved in by a pick handle. Now his body lay in a tent for four days until they could cobble together an inquest. 
In October of the same year, a man named Clark was stabbed to death, and in November, somebody set fire to the Elysian Flat Hotel. Yep, it was the wild west of the Victorian goldfields. The Elysian. Anyone at a distance and unacquainted with this place would naturally suppose from the name that it was the most favoured spot in all Australia Felix, that here the peaceful community lived in the most complete state of innocence and happiness, that here crime of any kind was only known in name, that law and order was religiously observed, that harmony and goodwill were the everyday exchanges among the happy and contented people, that terrestrial felicity reigned supreme, and in the neighbourhood of Sandhurst, the golden age had been revived. But how woefully disappointed would they be by a visit to the place, and a nearer knowledge of the present state of society there. They would see that the appellation of Elysian was a horrible misnomer, and that to call it pandemonium flat would be something a little nearer to the truth, as conveying an impression of the real state of things, where scenes of violence are quite common, where lawbreakers live without any fear of check or punishment for their misdeeds, where crimes of the most heinous nature are committed with impunity. north of a whipstick village on the way to Elysian Flat is Flagstaff Hill and it was so named because once there was a red and white flag flying here by day and a lantern by night both here to guide lost diggers back to civilization. Now this came about at the insistence of a local identity who once lived out here called Whipstick Bob. Now Whipstick Bob was a great bushman and he was usually respond responsible for finding the lost souls out here dead and alive in the scrub. On one occasion when he found a body out in the scrub, he ended up having to pay for the funeral as well. One poor fella managed to survive out on the whipstick for three weeks. Amazingly, he was coming from Adelaide to Bendigo to try his luck when he found himself lost in the whipstick. An old timer once told Bill Perry, author of Tales of the Whipstick, that in any of the quartz that you can find on Flagstaff Hill, you would find about two or three pennyweights of gold per load, which is about a tonne after crushing. One pennyweight is about 0.065 of a gram. At current gold prices of about $45 a gram of gold, that's about $30 for cutting out and crushing one tonne of quartz. No thanks. Here on the northern banks of Flagstaff Hill is the ruins of this wonderful old miner's hut. Now on the inside it measures around 3 metres by 3 metres and the walls an impressive 1 foot or 30 centimetres thick. Now the old chimney was about 1.5 metres across the back by close to the same deep, which is about the standard size for chimneys uh, of old miners' huts in the whipstick. But look how thick the back of this chimney is, at least two foot thick. I reckon once they got the fire going and these old stones warmed up, once that fire went out, I reckon they stayed warm for days. There's actually quite a few ruins of old foundations throughout the whipstick, but if you weren't looking for them, you'd walk right past. And when you look at these old huts, it's tempting to think that they built the walls a couple of metres high and, and then stuck the roof over the top and it was nice and spacious. Well, that's not how they built them at all. The walls tended to be about two or three feet high and then they put the gable. And even though people were a little bit shorter in those days, I reckon that the only place they would have been able to stand up would have been in the middle of the hut. Now, the, now the, the gable itself would have been saplings or light, you know, small trees, uh, anything that was nearby and handy that they could, you know, turn into a gable and, and tie down. And then the roof, well, it could have been tin if they were really lucky, canvas. Uh, and if they weren't and they had to find what was around, maybe bark and branches put in over the top of each other, piled up to keep the rain out, keep it warm so that fireplace was able to do its job.
In October 1863, a lone digger, Joseph Woodward, was wandering around the bush looking for anything that might look like promising ground. He'd been working the nearby Sebastian Reef, but due to some issues with a local landowner there wanting a share of any gold found, Woodward was keen to try his luck elsewhere. Now just near here, in Raywood Gully, Woodward dug a six foot shaft and he found a few pieces of gold weighing up to around three ounces each. Now he told a few of his mates back at Sebastian and by the end of that year, the rush was on. Around 2,000 diggers and their families work in the Raywood Gully. Rush-o, rush -o. And on Tuesday, a rush took place at a fine looking flat that adjoins Raywood Gully. And one of the scenes which we read about followed. Some 500 diggers with picks and shovels racing for dear life to be first on the ground, shouting out with might and main, rush oh, rush oh, soon pegged off the ground. During the general scramble, numerous disputes and fights occurred for claims, but few seemed inclined to sink their shafts, and after some hours, and the new rush subsided, to be renewed again as soon as the next big speck of gold is found by those who have the enterprise to prospect the flat properly. Yes, the practice of shepherding was alive and well on Raywood, with too many diggers willing to sit back and wait and see how their neighbours fared. Now there were new bylaws set up for Raywood by the Sandhurst Mining Board, and that put a dampener on the intentions of these shepherds. There was plenty of gold still being found on Raywood Gully though, and the diggers kept coming. One nugget, found it just 10 foot deep, weighed a whopping 113 ounces. It's interesting to know how fast things worked on the rushes. Now gold was discovered in Raywood on October the 22nd, 1863. And by mid-December, there was branches of the Bank of New South Wales and the Oriental Bank already open for business. A month later, the Bank of Victoria and the Union Bank also had branches open for business. Like Bendigo, it was their custom on a Saturday night to show off the nuggets that they'd brought during the week in their windows. As well as the banks and the sea of canvas tents, two streets were soon mapped out and all kinds of shops and several pubs started springing up. Soon Inglewood Street was a thriving thoroughfare and lucky diggers could eat, drink, dance and be merry as long as there was gold in their pockets. Inglewood Street presented a picturesque sight on Tuesday evening to those unaccustomed to a rush. Groups of diggers might be seen wandering up and down or reclining beneath the trees with which the thoroughfare is studded. Their varied costume was brought out in bold relief by the glowing light of the numerous naphtha lamps hanging outside the different stores while two large fires from burning trees at opposite ends of the town, lighting up the various tents of the diggers, peeping out beneath the trees, formed a picture on which light and shade succeeded each other in unceasing variety. On the whole, the place was very orderly, the diggers being by no means quarrelsome, <laughs> rather the reverse, many amusing themselves by dancing, and others singing, then you'll remember me, <laughs> in a style of feeling that, like Richard Swiveller, they were apostrophizing some absent Sophie. As merry as it all sounded, like any of the diggings where men from all walks of life gathered to find their fortune, trouble could start at any moment. Only a couple of months into the rush, two diggers approached a lone man in his tent asking for a light of their pipes. Now the man agreed on the condition that they buy him a drink, to which they responded with a couple of unpleasant remarks. The lone man, he picked up an axe and started swinging wildly at the two men, cutting one of their heads. A crowd gathered, the man kept on lunging at the two men, mad as a hatter. And no one dared get the weapon off him, until a boy tripped him over, allowing a couple of diggers to pounce on him and relieve him of his axe. Here along Myers Creek on the western edge of the Whipstick, once upon a time, this was the location of one of the wildest rushes ever to happen around Bendigo. Although the rush only lasted a short time, beginning in 1867, there was 28 licensed hotels here at one stage, along with 65 beer shanties, all catering for a mob of thirsty diggers. No nuggets of any note were found here, and shaft sinking was fairly deep at around 25 feet. 
Shepherding again was common with many claims pegged out, but only about half of them saw a shovel. Again, the Sandhurst Mining Board regulations came into play. They stated that any claim needed to be occupied and worked for at least two hours a day between 9 and 11 a.m. So that's what the shepherds did. They worked between 9 and 11 a.m. and promptly left the scene in numbers. By July 1867, there was close to 2,000 diggers working here. And by all reports, it was a dog's breakfast, with tents and temporary stores and beer shanties all set up in the mud as close as possible to the diggings. In August alone, 15 hotel licences were granted for Myers Creek. Now, they were mainly temporary buildings. A lot of the beer shanty owners also did the right thing and got themselves licences at the nearby Eagle Hawk Police Courts. One of the applicants was a 10-year-old boy. His father, who was the owner of one beer shanty, didn't think he could own two, so made the second application in the name of his son. Unlike Elysian Flat, a police station was soon erected here, but it did little to improve the nature of the Myers Creek village. There are six or seven dancing saloons on the rush, all of which are extensively patronised two of which might be characterised as dens of infamy and harbours of prostitutes. Shortly after midnight one Sunday night, a drunken row broke out in the dancing saloons, during which a man had his arm broken and most filthy language indulged in. Apparently, there was occasional discord among the dancing girls. One Friday afternoon, two young women were engaged in a verbal battle outside Schuller's dancing saloon which developed into a pugilistic encounter. One of the actors in this disgraceful exhibition appeared before her opponent in a half-dressed state. Before the conclusion of the melee, a large crowd had gathered and a ring was formed in orthodox style. During the fight or row, one of the Amazons divested herself of what little clothing she had on and appeared before her audience in a state of nudity. At its peak, there were around 4,000 diggers working the Myers Creek diggings, including 500 Chinese. Now, there were often fights with the Europeans as they attempted to use muscle to push the Chinese out of paying claims. On one occasion, a few blokes tried to peg off part of a claim owned by the Chinese. Now, the Chinese fought back pretty hard and they hung on to their claim. Another known trick a few less scrupulous diggers would use if they found themselves with a shicer, that is a claim with little or no gold, is what's called salting the claim. Now the digger, in trying to sell his claim to an unsuspecting new chum, would add a little gold or salt his pan with a little gold to try and make his claim look richer than what it was. Unfortunately for some, this worked as often as it failed. By the early 1860s, alluvial rushes of any significance were becoming few and far between, and diggers were increasingly taking on the many quartz reefs within the whipstick in the hunt for gold. Now, quartz mining is a whole different ball game to the alluvial mining of the initial rushes. Not only the effort required to remove that gold-bearing quartz, but that quartz also needs to be crushed in order to extract the gold. Quartz mining in the Whipstick also brought with it the introduction of larger and better organised companies, along with share speculation and trading, where often the real money was made. Here on Bolle's Reef was one of the first quartz mining efforts in the Whipstick by a couple of prospectors who discovered a quartz reef just under the surface of this hill. Now the quartz was studded with gold, and the find brought with it a lot of excitement once the news broke in early 1862. They crushed 10 tonnes of quartz, which they extracted from a depth of 14 feet, or about four and a half metres. Now this won them 107 ounces of gold, which is nothing to sneeze at. They would have needed to cart the quartz to be crushed, possibly at nearby Old Tom's Gully, and the work would have been far from easy. Bollet's Reef was later reported to have failed to live up to its initial potential and by mid-1863 was pretty much deserted. Mm -hmm. 
here on Old Tom's Gully, named after, get this, Old Tom, the unsophisticated Hibernian, whoever that was. Small companies mine the quartz reef here from the early 1860s. Throughout the scrub around here, there are quite a few old chimney foundations, a sign that once upon a time, there was a small community living here. One of the companies, the Derbyshire Mining Company, they employed about six blokes and they set up a quartz crushing operation here. Now, as you can see by the mountains of sand all around here, over the next 50 years, there was a hell of a lot of rock crushed here as different companies took turns working the reef. Most of the open cut quartz reef mining in the Whipstick was at fairly shallow depths. And throughout the Whipstick are some great examples of open cut quartz mines like this one, also on Old Tom's Gully. southern edge of the Whipstick, larger mining companies started quartz mining here from the 1860s onwards. Now these operations were far more extensive in how they removed and processed the quartz and with that of course came employing more men. Now these men who may have been previously out in the bush digging for gold were now getting a regular wage but the price was that the dream of striking it rich on your own terms had to be put aside. Now the quartz was crushed into fine sand. The new moon had 71 stampers arranged in blocks of four or five. They weighed either 700 or 900 pounds and were run by steam engine. And the quartz was first broken down using rock breaking machines. They were then loaded onto a tramway and taken 1200 feet to be crushed by the stampers in boxes. A huge amount of water was used to flush the crushed quartz through and mercury was added as the gold amalgamated to the liquid metal. These were called pyrites, which were concentrations of gold and mercury, and were separated from the sand using what was effectively a vibrating table. The concentrate was then roasted in special furnaces and finally treated with cyanide to recover the gold, which was then smelted into cakes. A little further down from Lightning Hill is the Moon Reef, one of the richest quartz reefs in the Whipstick and part of what was called the Golden Mile. The new moon mining company worked the reef for nearly 50 years and for a large part of that time was a well run operation giving good returns to shareholders for their investment. Along with the New Moon, there was the North New Moon, the Suffolk United and the South New Moon mining companies who between them extracted 550,000 ounces of gold by the time the last of them closed in 1941. To win this gold, they reduced 1.2 million tonnes of rock to sand. They must have left some very big holes underneath us. Now another way that men eked out a living in the whipstick in the later years for themselves and their family was through the making of eucalyptus oil. Now obviously there were plenty of eucalyptus trees around and there were small factories dotted throughout the forest, all employing you know, small numbers of men. Now 
Now today, the site of these old factories are easily identified, as you'll often find an old abandoned boiler like this one, and the site of a dam for water nearby. Now the yuki leaves were piled high into an airtight chamber or large drum where steam from the boiler could be shot in to help sweat the oil out from the leaves. Cold water from the dam was then added to the chamber before being drained into a separate vat. The oil was collected with the cold water and as water and oil don't mix, the oil was scooped from the top of the water and then bottled. This industry operated in the whipstick well into the 20th century before cheaper overseas produced yuki oil made it too tough for the local producers to compete. Whipstick today has no real industry other than visiting gold fossickers and a few hobby farms dotted throughout the forest. There are still many remnants of its golden history to be found throughout the forest, but as the years go by, these deteriorate as the mud that held stones for chimneys and walls together slowly washes away. In some parts, like here along Slum Gully, there are many remains of old miners' huts, where, according to one local old-timer who's still with us, was once part of the track from Eagle Hawk out to Flagstaff Hill. Other interesting locations include the old hotel at Miller's Flat and the site of the once popular Majetti's Wine Bar, once considered the unofficial community hall of the Whipstick. It had a long earthen bowling rink out the front for playing Italian bowls. It was a length of a cricket pitch and around eight foot wide. The game is similar to modern day lawn bowls, though the balls were larger and perfectly round. Everywhere the remains of mining ventures and short rushes remind observant visitors that the Whipstick Forest was once a hive of activity, attracting hopeful diggers from more corners of the globe. Whipstick no longer contains any wild turkeys, as the first white explorers to the forest boasted of, but it is home to many kangaroos and wallabies who live relatively free of threat among the ironbark, box, yellow gum and mallee bush.
hope you've enjoyed our tour of the Whipstick. You never know, you might come across me out here one day on one of its many tracks. Until then, thanks for watching. Light jump ship, I've hold the town. This was not sailing this way. To fields of gold with dreams come true. Nothing get in my way. I made it here to eagle hawk through means I need not say. Struck gold in the chaos of Red Hill, but I drank it all away. Well, I teamed up with some brother jacks. Well, I claim was on Sydney flat. Chinese, Germans, Americans too. Van Diemen lags. Scars on their backs. So buy me a drink, boys, and I tell you my tale. Vine and bark and blind and wild horse. Loud in the west. I lost my 